Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for our final webinar in our election series, What Now? Um, I'm going to just go through some really quick housekeeping rules before we get started. We will be taking Q&A throughout the duration of this entire hour. There will not just be a designated period at the end. So feel free to use your chat or the Q&A feature to, to post your questions. And we will be going until two o'clock and we're looking forward to a really productive discussion today. I will now hand it over to Dean Miller to do some introductory remarks. Hi, welcome and thank you for joining us. This is the fourth installment of the Wellbeing webinar series focused on helping our USC community navigate a time of political divisiveness while maintaining mutual respect for each other. We have all been through the ringer this year. Not only are we coping with a global pandemic, but America's political climate has reached a dangerous boiling point. I think we're all tired, we're all frustrated, and we're processing a lot. But we have a number of resources available at, here at the university to support you. And today we'll be hearing from experts about how to bring the temperature down um, in the wake of a very tense presidential election season without losing sight of the fact that robust debate is a good and healthy thing. Universities should be environments for this kind of debate because we stand for intellectual honesty and integrity, for wrestling, wrestling with the best evidence available to create new knowledge, and for giving students the analytical training to evaluate evidence for themselves. And this is one of our top priorities at USC Dornsife. Our panel of terrific experts today is gonna to talk about navigating differences of opinion without discarding facts or resorting to personal attacks and finding respect and admiration for people who have different perspectives. Our terrific moderator um, is Kimberly Freeman. She is the Associate Dean and Chief Diversity Officer for us at USC Dornsife. She is an experienced corporate community and educational leader with over 30 years of experience. She brings a unique mix of formal and experiential education drawn from her interests at the intersection of business, government, and higher education policies, affecting California's most vulnerable communities. Her vision is to achieve representational diversity and, and, and create an inclusive culture for faculty, students, and staff by leveraging social connectedness and the wisdom of multiple perspectives. She earned her degree in industrial engineering and operations research from UC Berkeley and holds a master of public policy from USC. She also earned an MBA and a doctorate in educational leadership from UCLA. Um, Kimberly is going to introduce the rest of the panelists today, so I will turn it over to her. Kimberly. Thank you, uh, Dean Miller, for that wonderful uh, introduction, and thank you to all of our guests today. I will introduce our two speakers, and then I will also uh, turn this over to Eileen Rosenstein, who is our Associate Vice Provost of Campus Wellbeing and Education, who will actually conduct the uh, moderation of the panel this afternoon. So let me begin by introducing Pedro Noguera, the Emory Stoops and Joyce King Stoops Dean of the USC Rossier School of Education and is a distinguished professor of education. Prior to joining USC, Dr. Noguera served as a distinguished professor of education at the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA. He has also served as a tenured professor and holder of endowed chairs at NYU, Harvard, and the University of California, Berkeley. He is the author of 15 books, including Common Schooling, Conversations About the Tough Questions and Complex Issues Confronting K-12 Education in the United States Today with Rick Hess, and City Schools and the American Dream, Still Pursuing the Dream with Issa Saeed. I'd also like for us to welcome Bob Shrum, the Carmen and Lewis Warshaw Chair in the Practical Politics and Director of the USC Dornsife Center for the Political Future. Bob is a renowned political strategist and consultant who was once described as the most sought after consultant in the Democratic Party by the Atlantic Monthly. He has worked on high level campaigns and administrations, including Ted Kennedy, Joe Biden, John Glenn, John Kerry, Al Gore, and Gordon Brown, just to name a few. At USC Dornsife, he's focused on helping us bring together political actors from across the aisle to engage in civil fact-based conversations. I'd now like to turn the program over to Eileen Rosenstein, Associate Vice Provost in our Campus Wellbeing and Education Office. Thank you. Thanks, Kimberly. 
and thank you all for coming. Um, so I really want to give this some context that this is the, as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dean Miller said, uh, the end of a uh, series of four, where we've been talking about the election and we started prior to the actual election in November. And now here we are, and we really thought it'd be appropriate to ask now what? We saw tremendous energy on our campus of people being engaged in this process, talking back and forth. But the question is now, where are we? We're still in this transition period. And so I want to start off uh, by asking um, um, uh, uh, Pedro some questions in terms of, um, you're one of the nation's leaders in urban education and social uh, inequality. And I'm wondering, could you just share with us some of your thoughts about the election and kind of this in-between period? Um, you know, concerns, things that um, you think are important for us to note. Yeah, thanks, Eileen. And uh, it's great to be with all of you for this conversation. Uh, you know, in some ways, I wish we could start to look forward uh, to <laughs> the next administration, but um, the Trump administration is clearly not over. And uh, the latest news is he's trying to meet with the members of the Michigan State Legislature to, I don't know, try to maneuver a change in the results of the election. So um, there's still a lot of tension out there. Um, and, and the tension adds to the existing polarization. Uh, that we know is, is, is rampant in the country. Um, <clears throat> what I've tried to do is to uh, think about why people have voted the way they do uh, without falling into the trap of simply um, attributing the differences to racism, though I do think racism is a huge factor uh, in this, has been in this race and in this uh, current, in the Trump administration. But I know, just from knowing my neighbors and knowing others um, who I found out voted for Donald Trump, that there are people who I know to be decent people who voted differently than I did. And so I'm trying to understand why. And, and, and the reason for that is because um, we still depend on each other. We are interdependent as a nation. I'm, I'm dependent on my neighbors as much as they are on me. And so we have to figure out how do we live together? How do we confront our common problems as a nation. And so <clears throat> despite the significance of the differences, which are real, I think there's also a lot in common. I, I'm looking at the long lines across the country now for food. So many Americans out of work, at risk of losing their benefits, and the lines are getting longer and longer. People who have to go and seek food because they can't, um, they don't have enough to eat and now would be faced with the threat of eviction soon too on a scale we've never seen. So um, we have a lot to do to try to make this nation whole. And uh, getting past the polarization, I think will be key to get to the place of problem solving. Great, thank you. And Bob, I wanna ask you the kind of same question. You've worked as a senior advisor on so many uh, campaigns and what does this election say to you? And what do you think are the salient points that we should be aware of, including during this uh, transition time? Well, I, first of all, a shout out to Dean Miller and to this series. I'm honored to be here and to be part of it. Uh, one thing I would say is that there are areas where we have to think about why, uh, and Pedro was touching on this, why some people voted for Trump. And I agree with him that there's a big element of racism here, but there's something else that's happened. Uh, uh, Biden carried counties that account for 70% of the GDP. Trump carried counties that ca account for 30% of the GDP. Now the GDP doesn't vote, uh, but uh, just like acres don't vote. Uh, but what that tells you is that a lot of people uh, especially non-college educated people, non-college educated whites, uh, have been hurt by globalization and they've been left out largely of the recovery after the 2008-2009 economic crash. So that's one element, I think. And Trump 
actually as president didn't do anything for them. But what he does do is express their sense of grievance uh, and their anger and their alienation. Uh, there's a second uh, element of this, I think, which is that there are a lot of folks, and they're not all racist, who are uh, alienated by the demographic and cultural changes in the country. America is becoming a majority non-white country. Uh, California is already a majority non-white state. Uh, we've seen vast changes in terms of women's rights, LGBTQ rights. Uh, and I think some people want to go back to a largely imagined 1950s, which wasn't so good for a lot of folks, by the way, but they'd like to go back. And Trump appeals to that in them. Uh, what I'm most disturbed about right now is the concerted effort by the president and people around him uh, to uh, basically overthrow the democratic process. Uh, you know, I went through a tough election in 2000. Uh, we were sitting there on election night having dinner. We thought we'd won the election. They withdrew the call from Florida. Uh, 37 days sitting around the vice president's dining table at his house. Uh, on the phone with folks in Florida. Uh, and then we made the mistake after the Florida Supreme Court said, you got to count all the ballots. We made the mistake of going out to dinner again. And in the middle of dinners, the Mater D walked over and said, the US Supreme Court has just issued an order stopping the count in Florida. We all know how it ended. Uh, and in a phone call with Al Gore later that night, a number of us were on the call, I said, there's no avenue left. You know, there's nothing we can do. Uh, we never even contemplated the idea of trying to go to a state legislature in a state that might have a democratic legislature, but that had voted for Bush and say, why don't you guys just appoint electors? And because that's all we you could have. It could have been as small as a state with three electoral votes. And that would have made Gore president. We never even contemplated that because it would be a fundamental tearing of, uh, of, of the fabric of the country and of democracy itself. So Al Gore conceded, uh, it felt awful, it still does. I always say that he was elected but not inaugurated. And I still feel bad because there would have been no Iraq war and there would have been no disappearing surplus. But what Trump is doing now is quite different than the election controversy in uh, 2000, which involved one state and 537, a 537 vote lead for Bush. You know, you're talking about the serious consequences to our democracy and to the people in our nation. And as there's an uneasiness as all of these kind of um, challenges are happening, and there are many people who are still kind of feeling that the election was stolen, basically. There, you know, there are people who are kind of uh, still thinking that um, that has happened. And there's many people who believe that our system is corrupt, maybe rigged, or not, as you're saying, Bob, not interested in helping people like themselves. And so at this point, how do we help people embrace our democracy and, you know, to bring up the various views. How, you know, because if they don't believe in the process and the institution, I'm really concerned about that as well. Well, first, if we, if we don't get through this period, that is, if the president's uh, efforts would somehow or other succeed, I'm not sure there's anything left to embrace because it means that fundamental pillars of our democracy will have been shattered. Uh, if we do get through this period, and I think by the way that the aim here uh, is either to seize the election or to turn Joe Biden into an illegitimate president, uh, he's gonna take over uh, with the biggest set of problems dumped into any president's lap since FDR, but he's not gonna have FDR's majorities in the House and the Senate. Uh, so there's going to have to be some compromise. There's going to have to be a way of kind of working things out. 
And one thing I do think it's very important for him to do is to understand uh, what Roosevelt did. Uh, and he, Roosevelt said, my, my priorities in order are relief, recovery, and reform. Uh, and Biden's priorities have to be relief from COVID, recovery from what's happened in the economy, mm -hmm. uh, and then you can move on to these reform issues. Some, some progressives might not like that, but those are the urgent priorities before the country, and you have to make sure that you include these left out areas uh, in the economic recovery. For example, you could uh, create incentives for businesses and companies to move into those places, use community colleges to help train people so that they're ready for those jobs and they could be better paying jobs than what they have or the ones they've lost. It's a little like what JFK did with the Area Redevelopment Act um, in 1961 after he had seen the squalor in which people were living in West Virginia. But it, that's a long way of saying, I think you can't repair this until you begin to show people real results in their lives. It won't be repaired by rhetoric. I thought Biden's speeches during the campaign were very powerful. They were very good. Uh, but what folks want and need is real results. A society that's back to normal, where everybody's not hiding from everybody else. Uh, a society that offers opportunity to people. I mean, my father was a tool and die maker, you know, and I, I went to Georgetown and then Harvard and, you know, and, and those opportunities were very open, uh, at least to, to, to white people then, less so to people of color. But we got to open them up to everybody and we've got to let people know uh, who live in the little town in Western Pennsylvania that I was born in, and that um, thankfully my parents left when, and, and, and took me with them when I was you know, very young. Uh, we've got to give them a sense of hope and a sense of investment in the system. And that's going to be tough because you're going to have a lot of Republicans. Uh, and by the way, in the Monmouth poll today, over 70% of Republicans say that the election was stolen. You're going to have a lot of Republicans in the Senate, uh, Trump maybe, who, who, who don't want to do anything. Trump is probably going to announce uh, after the Secret Service escorts him out of the White House on January 20th that he's going to run for president again. So it's, it's going to be a very fraught time, and yet Biden has to figure out how to fight his way through that and to get some real results for people. And this goes to something that, uh, Pedro, you said about the polarization. I mean, when you hear that statistic, that um, such a large majority of Republicans feel like they stole the, and then we have these real life problems like you're talking about people in food lines. How do we start really dealing with that tension of difference? How do we start dialoguing when people feel so strongly, you know, and, and it's, it's adversarial? I mean, any thoughts on that? Well, it's, it's um, you know, we are divided, um, you know, as, as Bob was saying, we don't live together, right? Our neighborhoods are also, uh, and our communities are relatively homogenous in, in many parts of the country. And so, um, you know, that may be less true in certain areas than others, but the ability to have dialogue when you don't have a lot of contact um, um, is diminished. But I want to go back to what Bob was saying. I think that um, if we start by focusing on improving people's lives, um, that that starts to make a tangible difference. And, and, and people need to see that um, the next administration can make a, a tangible benefit in their quality of life. And because uh, ultimately, I think there's a lot of alienation and anger all around because of uh, this sense that the American dream the idea that you could work hard and get ahead is has gone, it, and and as it does, I think desperation grows, and more and more people. You know, if you look at the, the white working class population of the country, it's the only segment of the society with a declining life expectancy. Right now, as guns are being bought at a rate we've never seen before, suicide rates are going up. What people don't realize: those guns are disproportionately being used for people to kill themselves. And that's more likely to happen amongst older white males. So Trump's base, uh, despite the fantasy that he's presented that of bringing America back 
to the glory days of the 50s. Trump's base is hurting. And uh, they may right now have latched on to him as a savior. Um, but I think if, if, you know, it's amazing, you know, when you wonder, because I, I ask my neighbors, say, again, um, two of them, one who's of Mexican heritage, one who's white, uh, what it is that they saw in him. And they, they can't say anything tangible. Uh, one, uh, his son is a, is a veteran, and, and uh, he believes somehow that Trump is going to be more pro-military and do a better job taking care of people in the military. Um, the other just thinks, I, I don't think she says it, but I think she believes it, that white people will be better off with someone like Trump in office. Um, and I think there's that sentiment that's out there too. Um, <clears throat> So once we can get past the, um, the kind of the shadow of Trump, which hangs over all of us, and he's, as we know, he's in the media every single day on Twitter, it's relentless. Once that recedes a bit, then I, I think the Biden administration has to do the hard work of really addressing the kind of bread and butter issues that Bob spoke about. Because it's when people sense, uh, uh, their sense of hope is revived about the future, that I do believe that the, their better instincts will prevail and we'll start to see people um, a little less angry. I always wondered, why is it that the Trump rallies are always so angry? Why are they always so mad? And I think it's because of, of what Bob described, this sense that, that they've fallen behind. Um, and, 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 but that, that feeling is there for lots of communities. And so now we have to make sure that, um, <coughs> that people, there's a real tangible sense of improvement in the quality of life. So it brings up another question which has to do with media uh, in a way, because how do we get our information and how do we get the facts and how, and how does that play into this um, sense of either futility for some people or even the sense of anger that you're noting? Um, you know, where does the media play into all of this? Because that is something that is, you know, constantly there and, and the way we do connect and see each other. Well, I, I'll take that, I guess. Uh, look, in 1962, uh, if a young producer at CBS had gone to Walter Cronkite, who was the avatar of Newsman, and said, uh, uh, Mr. Cronkite, uh, the John Birch Society is holding a press conference in New York today, and they're going to reveal that President Eisenhower is a conscious agent of the communist conspiracy, and so is President Kennedy. Uh, how many camera crews do you want me to send? Cronkite would have looked up and said, you don't work here anymore. Uh, in the 60s, we had a kind of common knowledge base because we had gatekeepers and they had standards. Uh, that's all gone. I mean, we have now proven that Daniel Patrick Moynihan was wrong. Uh, he said, everybody's entitled to their own opinions, but not their own facts. Today, everybody can get their own facts. They go to whatever media outlet they want. There's a proliferation of cable media outlets. Social media has done a number of very good things, by the way, like democratized fundraising so that small contributions can actually make a real difference. But social media is also pernicious because it allows people to replicate what, they, what Pedro was talking about in their lives, which is they live in homogeneous neighborhoods. They get their information from homogeneous sources and it can be completely different than reality. I mean, one of the things we're trying to do at the center is model and advance the idea of a politics where we respect each other and we respect the truth. Uh, and I have no illusions that we're going to do that all by ourselves, but I think you have to make big efforts to do that. Uh, finally, I would say the one thing that can break through this more than anything else is if people once again feel that government cares about them, is working for them, and is making a tangible difference in their lives. Uh, to go, That's probably the thread that's going through this whole conversation. Uh, at that point, I think more and more people will say, uh, you know, I feel pretty good about this. Look, if Je the, just before JFK was shot, he had a 60% approval rating, about 72% outside the South. And, you know, his legislative agenda was, was, if any, 
the best way to say it was really formidable to pass the civil rights bill and the tax cut. Uh, but we are now so polarized that it's hard to imagine a president having a 60% approval rating or a 72% approval rating. Uh, and the only way we're ever going to get back there, in my view, is if people see that things are happening for them and for their children that really matter. Uh, it's, it's very depressing when you look at some of the data, when you ask people, do you think uh, your kids will have a better life than you do? And so many of them don't. Uh, and that's a contradiction of at least what America imagines its ideals to be. Uh, and it leaves people, I think, feeling angry. Uh, Pedro's talking about the, the crowds at the rallies. Uh, at the Trump rallies. I think they're emblematic of this. Are we going to get all those people back? Are we going to get a common base, basis of knowledge completely the way we did in the 60s? No. But I think we can make progress toward a society where there's a decent amount of civility, a decent respect for facts, and nobody ever says alternative facts because there's no such thing as alternative facts, uh, and where folks feel that somehow or other progress is being made. Yeah, I, I worry a lot about the, the, the way media has evolved um, because it's so uh, fragmented and, and people now choose the media platform that affirms their beliefs. And, and many of us know now that social media gives us what we want to hear. <laughs> um, and, and, and so instead of educating and informing, rumors and misinformation spreads. And... Uh, I was just listening to an interview with uh, former President Barack Obama, you know, who was talking about the fact that for so long, he refused to even take the birther rumor seriously until his aides kept telling him, no, this is, this has traction. <laughs> this is, people believe not only that, that you were uh, born in Kenya or someplace, they believe that you're an agent of the Muslims, that, you know, there were all kinds of things. And so the sad thing is you would want to hope that you could just simply ignore uh, misinformation, um, but, the, but you can't. And, and especially when it's being uh, perpetrated by the President of the United States. So <laughs> I, I don't know what we do about that. I think that um, universities uh, have a major role to play. You know, one of the things that uh, we want to do at Ross here is launch something we're calling the Democracy Project because uh, we really need to rethink the way we teach civics in this country to, to kids. Kids are not being prepared to be voters and to be citizens and to understand the Constitution, understand their rights. Most Americans can't name the three branches of government, um, don't know uh, about the cause of the Civil War. Uh, over half of students don't even know about the Holocaust. So we have a lot of work to do to educate this country. And it doesn't mean you need to have um, an advanced degree, but there's a common literacy we should have that allow us as citizens to engage in civil debate and to look at evidence and make up our minds. It doesn't mean everyone's gonna agree on everything, but we need a, a common basis of facts uh, <clears throat> so that we can in fact have reasoned discussion. And that's missing right now. The media, unfortunately, you know, the media to blame the media is, is you know, doesn't say a lot because it's which media, you know, <laughs> it's so many different platforms out there. So which media are you getting your information from? And that's the problem. Uh, there is no coherence and there's very little credibility out there. Um, so um, I, I, the misinformation I think is our greatest threat right now. But I also think I hear you saying that education and our K through 12 and even higher education can really be a place where we start training people to kind of how do you question what's being stated in front of you. One of the things that really struck me was, uh, I, hopefully I got this right, but $14 billion was spent on the election. $14 billion. And it's not like we are more, are more informed public. Um, I had to go look in and like look at the issues, like actually go to try to find the issues. Um, any thoughts on how to 
kind of educate in a, an election differently or, you know, use our K through 12 to, or higher ed to how to kind of judge what we're being told as citizens? It's a tough, thinking, so go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead, no, go ahead, Pedro. I, I'm thinking about the same thing. I mean, that, that money, I, I was looking at, I think they said uh, they spent 74 million to try to defeat Susan Collins in Maine and, and didn't work. So it raised the question, what is the money being spent on and how effective? And um, in my opinion, <laughs> if we had, if the two parties had taken that money and hired people to talk to their neighbors, right? And train them first. And so they put the money into the hands of ordinary citizens <laughs> rather than into Facebook, into political ads. It, maybe that would have been a better use. I, if, I, I really think we have too much money in politics, uh, first of all, and it, uh, it does lead to corruption. Um, not, not corruption, well, corruption in the sense that it allows those with the most money to have the most influence. Um, and um, I, I don't know if that's a reform that we're gonna be able to address anytime soon, given the makeup of the court, but uh, it's, it's a real problem. It does threaten democracy. Um, and it raises the question though, of, of how do we counter the kind of, of misinformation that's comes through the media when the ads um, are allowed to uh, circulate the way they do. So it, it, again, it goes back to the point of education. People need to be able to have, uh, to think critically. They need to be able to look at an ad, which is really hard when you look at the propositions here in California, hard to know how to make sense of them after a while. Um, but we, universities, and, and Amber Miller said this at the very beginning, need to be places where we demonstrate it's possible to, to discuss and debate important issues uh, using evidence uh, that we don't shut people down because we disagree with them. We don't censor people. Um, that's not what university should be about. Um, and I think that uh, some of the criticism uh, that's been leveled against, uh, you know, institutions like, you know, the one we're part of, um, we need to take into uh, our hearts and figure out what's a better way to allow for the democracy that we believe is so important to flourish on our campuses as well. Uh, let, let me comment on that. First of all, I want to go back to this point about civics uh, and what, Pedro, what you're going to do with this democracy project. Uh, I, don't, I think there are schools all over this country where we don't teach civics anymore. Uh, and people really basically don't learn about the institutions of this democracy. Uh, in fact, we just have a senator-elect from Alabama, Tommy Tuberville, who was asked, what are the three branches of government? And he said, the presidency, the House, and the Senate. Uh, so, you know, that's extraordinary if you think about it. Uh, so I think long term, we've got to get a commitment to educate a generation of young people uh, in what this democracy is all about. Uh, secondly, in terms of all the money that's sloshing around, uh, I think it will continue to grow. Uh, I think people will continue to advertise uh, because that's the most reliable way they think, uh, and there's some evidence for this, of uh, reaching especially older voters who are a huge segment of the electorate. Uh, and by the way, Pedro, what you were describing in terms of trying to get people to communicate one-on-one -on -one with folks, both parties are trying to do that. Uh, and they're trying very hard because there's so much money. The Biden campaign spent over a billion dollars. In 2000, I think we had for the general election because we took federal funding, we had like $74 million for the whole general election. That meant you had to tri triage states. You might think you had a chance in Colorado, but the money wouldn't go far enough, so you had to, you had to say, well, we're, we're gonna stop competing there. Uh, but finally, I think the other thing that matters here is character, the character of our leaders. Uh, in November of 1980, when Ronald Reagan uh, came to Washington for the first time, uh, he invited uh, Senator Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, to meet with him. Uh, we were a little startled. They didn't really know each other that well. They'd met before. Uh, and Kennedy came back from the meeting and said, uh, let me tell you three things. One, he's not dumb. And if people think he's dumb, they're completely misunderstanding him. 
Number two, we're going to have a lot of big disagreements. And number three, we're going to find areas to work together. So Reagan, for example, worked with Tip O'Neill to save Social Security, a program he had once wanted to abolish. Uh, he worked with Ted Kennedy on immigration reform and amnesty. Uh, and in the 1990s, after the failure of the Clinton health care plan, Kennedy said, I want to help poor kids in this country who can't get access to health care. Uh, so he introduced the S-CHIP program, which I think now ensures 8 million or 10 million kids. Uh, but he had to have a Republican co-sponsor. And he went to Orrin Hatch, the senator from Utah. And Hatch said, well, Ted, you know, I've got, I'm dubious about a great giant federal program. And Kennedy, who was quite good at this, said, in fact, he was a master of it, said, well, why don't we have the federal government pay for this and the states administer it? And Hatch said, well, I could do that. And so they passed that bill. But though today, I think Hatch would be terrified of making that agreement because of the polarization we've talked about. But character really matters. I think the character of Trump has corroded the character of a lot of his followers. Uh, but maybe we can get back to the point where people can find, they're not going to agree on, on a lot of things, but where they can find some things they do agree on. And to go back to the theme that we've been talking about all along, that actually make a difference in people's lives. You know, that for example, uh, don't confront a mother with the choice between buying this week's groceries or taking a child to a doctor. Well, this brings up one of the questions from our audience, uh, which is uh, kind of being brave and, uh, you know, is there an issue or a project that can engage our leaders um, from both sides of the aisle? Uh, and then the person says, especially when something like COVID, uh, mind boggling, it didn't happen, you know. Uh, how could that, you know, is there a way that people can be brave enough? What's the barriers that are stopping our leaders from working together? As are the examples you have both given. I, I think there were a lot of Republicans uh, uh, in the Senate, for example, uh, and certainly some in the House, uh, who would be prepared to work with a Biden administration on getting the whole country vaccinated, which I think would be a singular moment. If we do that, uh, people are going to look at everything differently. But then you're going to have to go on and deal with the other issues. But they're very afraid. They're afraid that Trump will take revenge on them, uh, oppose them in primaries. You look at you know, Jeff Flake, very conservative senator from Arizona, couldn't even run for re-election. What was his offense? He'd suggested that the president not tweet out outrageous things. And so he became Trump's mortal enemy. Uh, so that's the big barrier to doing it. The great challenge for Biden, and you know, for all, all we, you know, there's so many ironies here. I mean, the, the oldest president was elected by the youngest segment of the electorate. Uh, He's, he, he's been wanting to run for president for 35, 40 years. And he tried twice before and failed. But it may be a case here of the person meeting the moment because he does have certain skills in terms of dealing with people on the other side, like Mitch McConnell, uh, the Republican Senate leader, that may enable him to try and break through some of this. But you can bet that on the other side, or outside, uh, Donald Trump will be on cable TV and he'll be on Twitter and he'll be angry. And what he wants more than anything else is the utter failure of the Biden administration. Yeah, I, I wanna just follow up on that because I think um, that Bob is right, that the administrations needs to, uh, the Biden administration when it, when it assumes office, give the public something to do to, to help address the yawning needs. And I think uh, the vaccine gives us an opportunity. I, I think the, um, the, the, think about the missed opportunity after 9-11. Uh, after 9-11, the country was outraged, wanted to do something. And what did, what did the Bush administration tell us? Said, go shopping, go shopping to help the economy. You know, that was, that we need to do more than that. They need, we need to figure out how do we serve? How do we contribute 
That's what we did during World War II, right? During World War II, uh, ordinary citizens were called on to sacrifice, to contribute to the war effort, to, um, I think in this case, it's about uh, contributing to the good of society and educating the public, for example, because there'll be a lot of fear out there about the vaccine. So it's gonna be very important that credible people are educating their neighbors about why it's important and, and that credible people take the vaccine first to demonstrate that it's not dangerous. But um, we need to give people something to do to counter the alienation, the anger that's out there. But it's not gonna be easy. I, I was reading an article yesterday from the Director of Public Health for the state of Missouri, young woman who is being threatened. Her life is threatened because you know, she tells people to wear a mask. So um, you know, the, 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 the depth of the ignorance uh, around the, the, the pandemic um, is, is an obstacle, but I think, <laughs> I think that uh, Bob is right, that, that Bob, uh, I think that Biden is a very decent person, if that comes through, and that if people are willing to give him a chance over time, that, uh, and he's clear about what people can do, um, that'll make a difference. I, I know for myself, uh, right after the, the lockdown started, um, and we were all locked into our houses, um, there was a call to start distributing food at the schools here in LA. And despite my kids telling me I shouldn't do it, they said, you're too old, you're at risk. I went out there and it was the best I felt during the pandemic to help distribute food because when you're doing something to help others, you feel less helpless and less hope hopeless too. So I hope the administration can come up with practical things that are safe for people to do to support the common good. This brings to the next question from the audience too, which is what can USC as an elite university, um, how can we play a part in educating, not just economic um, people who are advantage or the elite, but uh, the very people who um, really need this support, who may also, uh, the um, audience members said, might be under the spell of an alternative, uh, alternative facts. How can we as a university uh, play a role? Well, the His Democracy Project, uh, and I think I have the name right, right, Pedro? Yeah, I think that's critical. And to the extent that uh, it can penetrate into classrooms across America and have an influence, it can begin to change things for the long term. What we're trying to do at the Center for the Political Future is try to change things now. And we know it's going to take a while. We know it's not going to be easy. We know we can't do it alone. But we want to try and change things now. Uh, the other thing that I think is, is really important, and Pedro was talking about it, gave me an idea. Uh, I think Biden would be very well served to get up and propose, along the lines of the Peace Corps, an American vaccine corps. And it would have different components. It would have a component of people who were gonna to talk to folks about the vaccine. It would have people, students who were taken out, you know, volunteered time from medical school, pharmaceutical school, nursing school, because some of these vaccines are complex and you can't have Joe Smith administering them uh, and try to vaccinate as many people as fast as possible. He's gotta catch the imagination of people. Uh, at the same time, universities, and this I think is Dean Miller's uh, insight with the academy and the public square, universities have to have an impact and an influence beyond their own gates, beyond just preparing another generation of students to go into STEM or go into teaching or whatever. The, if, when I think back to when I was young, which was some time ago, uh, universities play a very large and vigorous role in public life. Uh, I mean, Archibald Cox, the, the Harvard constitutional law professor, uh, ran the Kennedy uh, policy program during the 1960 campaign. And academics, whether you like them or not, I, I happen to love Arthur Schlesinger, uh, would leave the university for a while and be part of a presidential administration. Henry Kissinger is another example. And, a lot of people probably don't like him as much, but the university has to, in, it, it can't be just an internal marketplace of ideas. It has to widen the marketplace of ideas 
out into the world and can't be self-referential and can't just be talking to itself and its faculty and, and its students. You have to communicate ideas to folks. I couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more with Bob. I think that that is the real responsibility of a major university is to <clears throat> play a role in, in influencing the kind of the national conversation, informing the public. And, and you know, I, I think that, that, that we've receded from that role in recent years, but um, I, my hope is, and I know from hearing from President Fult, this is something that she believes in too, uh, we'll see more of it, not just from USC, but from other universities as well. Yeah. And then another question from our, our group is um, really regarding racism, which did, we have spoken about a little bit as playing a part. Um, what's the role of social justice messaging, like defund the police, in scaring otherwise well-meaning voters away from the Democratic Party? Can the Democratic coalition embrace both the diverse urban voter and the rural suburban white voter? Uh, look, defund the police was one of the dumbest slogans anybody ever thought of. I mean, if the, whoever thought it up should pay money to... <laughs> should not be paid money, but should have to pay money. Uh, and that, that's not just me. Jim Clyburn, uh, the congressman from South Carolina who had so much to do with Biden getting nominated, believes that, has said it. Uh, Bernie Sanders last Sunday on, on the talk show said, defund the police. He said, I'm not for defunding the police. I'm for reforming the police. I'm for holding the police accountable. Yes, I think it hurt. Uh, I think it hurt in uh, in a lot of marginal districts where Democrats, especially in House races, are narrowly losing races. I think it may have hurt in some Senate races that should have become more competitive. Uh, people have to understand, and I, you know, I used to, in the Democratic Party, get accused of being, oh, Bob's, Bob's such a liberal. Uh, well, I am, and I haven't moved. But people have to understand that you need to talk to folks in language that's accessible to them and that doesn't frighten them. Politics is not about psychic satisfaction for yourself. It's about changing the country. Let me follow up. I, I think that's, I, I agree with that. I think that, you know, you don't educate people through sound bites. So if, if what defund the police means is we don't want the police to be involved in uh, addressing homelessness because they're not qualified or responding to mental health crises because again, they're not qualified. We want to see reforms in the way we address those issues. We want accountability in the way policing is carried out in black communities and other poor communities around the country. Uh, so you have to be more precise in the language we use so that it doesn't get used against you. Um, and, and I think that's uh, something that uh, people on the left have often not been particularly good at, um, is how to use language in ways that builds bridges and that allows people to see a vision of a society that is in fact more just and more equitable. Because I think most people would like that at some level, um, at, but you have to be able to present it in a way that is palatable. And what, will, what you can talk about and how you talk about issues in a big city like LA is not the way you talk about them in rural communities um, in other parts of the country. And we've got to get better at, at being conversant and, and able, better able to respond in different settings to different communities. Otherwise, what, what we lose, and this is not simply about winning elections, what we lose is our ability as a nation to solve our common problems. If people don't believe that a problem is a problem unless it affects them directly, then we're in trouble, right? If we think that safety will be assured by everybody getting armed, then we're in trouble. We need to think about our common interest for, and, and climate change is a threat that's gonna affect everyone, although maybe in different ways. And so we need to think about how do we talk about these issues in ways that people can understand it and think about what they need to do to address these issues. And uh, unfortunately, race is used as the, as the means to divide people. Um, there are a lot of politicians who, who have figured out a long time ago that you can play to racism and bigotry to win elections and, um, and that works against us. So the only way to counter that 
is, I believe, to speak to broader common interest that uh, issues of equity and justice, the, the, the ideals that, that do resonate across our differences. You know, let, let me add something to that and take it down to the political level. Uh, uh, Biden lost Florida, I think, what well, we know, because he carried Miami-Dade by about 7%. Hillary Clinton had carried it by 29%. What happened in Miami-Dade? Uh, the, the, the Democrats who used the word socialist uh, gave uh, the Trump campaign fodder to say, Biden wants a socialist country. Uh, and they used defund the police on top of that. So you have a big political impact from that because Biden did everything else he had to do. He flipped Pinellas County, uh, which is critical in Florida. He carried Jacksonville, uh, but he collapsed completely in, in, in Miami Day. Uh, I think it does a disservice to a cause that I have deeply cared about my whole life, and that is racial justice and civil rights, uh, to adopt inflammatory terms that might make you feel good, but actually retard the possibility of achieving the goals you profess to believe in. Well, this leads to one of the questions that also um, someone from the audience said, because you're, you're talking about uh, an empathetic um, society, a place that we care, being careful about how we say things, um, yet there's still a lot of fear about Trump and in the future. And, um, and you know, the, so the question is really, if he's no longer under presidential protection, you know, and maybe his legal issues may earn him, this person say even jail time perhaps, how will he continue to be destructive in our nation? Because there's many people who were cheering and felt relieved when, uh, you know, the count came in for Biden, but there were also people crying at the same time saying, look what we've been through and look at the divisiveness that's happened. You know, um, it was a happy time, but there's also been a trauma in our nation. And so my question, uh, um, if I can paraphrase uh, the uh, audience member, is what kind of destruction, you know, in our national politics will he continue to do? Or, and again, some people think of Trump as just as the symptom, kind of like he's not the only piece here. He's the symptom, kind of he's the symptom, but he worsened the polarization. Right. Uh, to a point that we've hardly ever seen uh, since the Civil War. We're in the middle of a political civil war in this country. Uh, and I hope it doesn't go any further than that. Uh, look, he will have Secret Service protection uh, after he leaves the presidency. All ex-presidents do. He won't have Air Force One to use as a prop at political rallies. Uh, I don't know what he's going to do in terms of cable outlets. You know, he's threatening Fox because he's furious at Fox because they correctly called Arizona on election night. Uh, so now, and, and you're seeing as he tweets this stuff out, uh, an outlet like Newsmax suddenly get a million viewers a night. Uh, so I think Trump will be around. I think he will uh, cause as, uh, let me put this in neutral terms. He will push his case as hard as he possibly can, as he's doing now, without regard for the destruction or the damage it might do to the wider country. So I, I, don't, I don't want to give false hope that so, somehow or other, when the Electoral College finally meets, Biden finally gets elected, he gets inaugurated, assuming all of that happens. Uh, I don't want to give false hope that at that point, you know, you know we're, we're over it. And, and now, it is possible that you know, Trump will make some mistakes in the next couple of years, that he might become yesterday's news. But right now, it appears to me that if he announces that he's going to run in 2024, all these other Republicans who want to run are, are, are going to hold their powder. So I, I'm aware of the time, but, you know, we're talking about, you know, in some ways that we're still in the middle of it. We have a lot of work still to do. Do we, Either of you have a message to us as, a, as the USC community in regards to what each of us individually can do to help bring more of um, 
the world to a better place um, for us to feel more whole and healing. I am the AVP of well-being, so I, <laughs> I, I, I need to do this slant as an ending. I, I'd say you got to be involved. The biggest thing is you got to be involved and you got to care. And there are many different ways to be involved. Look at the success we've had since 2014 in raising the percentage of students on campus who are registered to vote. Uh, look at the opening of the Galen Center and the athletic teams uh, um, uh, taking care of the center and, and, and functioning there as election workers. I mean, there are many different ways to be involved, but you can't give up. Uh, and, you know, we have been through tough times before. I mean, in the, 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 the 60s civil rights, I mean, it was, it was really tough. And, you know, we went through, in 1968, a horrific year with the assassination of both Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. Uh, but you have to stay committed to whatever your beliefs are. Uh, and you have to go out there and fight for them. And you, you have to have a sense of principle and a sense that you're going to not just profess the principles, you're going to go out and fight for them. And by fight for them, I don't mean in some nasty way. Yeah, I, I would just echo what Bob said there. I, I, I just started watching the um, trial of the Chicago 7, which I was actually, what well, didn't think it was as good as I hoped, but it reminded me of what Bobby said, which is we've been through times of turbulence and conflict. We, you know, we had president killed, uh, um, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, the people, many people thought the country was falling apart and that we were on the brink of civil war then. So um, I remember in 1980 when Ronald Reagan got elected, uh, feeling awfully uh, depressed about the prospects for the country. Um, so we have to have the long view, um, but I think Bob's point about being involved, being informed is essential. And, and, and so I'd encourage uh, you know, the students and the others who are listening to this to think about ways that you can be involved in your community and beyond. Um, and I like the idea of a domestic Peace Corps. Um, we've had that before, right, too. Uh, Clinton started uh, with the AmeriCorps program. Uh, I'm on the board of City Year here in Los, uh, in Los Angeles. We need more like that. We need more ways to give people something concrete to do to reinforce a sense of hope and possibility about the future. That's how you counter desperation and fear. Well, first of all, I want to apologize to the audience that I didn't get to all of your questions, but what a rich conversation. Um, really, thank you both for really um, bringing up so many issues that are really relevant to what's happening now. Thank you both. Thank you.